So we are here to talk about refactoring. Um, so what is refactoring? A lot of you probably already know, but um, just as a, a recap, it's kind of restructuring or reorganizing or re-architecting your code and your files and your data structures and your directory structures and so on. Uh, so this can be like breaking long, um, func long functions into smaller functions, uh, moving code between files uh, or between modules, uh, renaming functions, things in general, moving files and directories around. Um, but the important thing is it doesn't change the external behavior. So you know, when you finish your refactoring, it should still work in the same way. So external behavior in this case could be like a web application. It could be if you're writing a library, it could be your public API. Um, that should stay the same. Uh, it's important because um, it improves readability of your code. Um, it reduces the complexity of your code. Um, and you know, it's more maintainable, which means when you need to add a new feature or something, then it takes less time than it would if you got this massive chunk of code that takes you a long time to get into like what's going on there. Uh, and, and most importantly, is it's like going to be a happier team, uh, and future you is going to be a lot happier as well. Um, and that's an important person. So in general, uh, the process of refactoring, uh, the most important thing is to have tests in place. Now, uh, when I say this, a lot of people assume that means automated tests. It doesn't. Um, automated tests are better because they're easier to it's loud, easier to repeat. But in general, if you've got like a process of steps that you can go through uh, and repeat, then that will work as well. Uh, and what you want to do is make small incremental changes to your code. Um, and then after each little change, you want to run your tests. Uh, if the tests pass, then keep going. Uh, if the tests don't pass, you've done something wrong, and you want to go back and, uh, and change it. So um, in Elixir, I would argue that refactoring is maybe easier than in a language like Ruby or JavaScript but probably not as easy as a language like Haskell or Elm, where the compiler gives you a lot of, um, a lot of warnings early. Um, because all the arguments are passed to the function, which means when you look at a function, you've got everything you need to know what's going on there. Um, it's compiled as well, so if you made a typo, uh, then you'll find out at compile time. Uh, and this is especially true if you're doing something like you know, working on an embedded device and you need to pull out your SD card, um, plug it in, and it's like, that didn't work. Take your SD card out again, put it back in your laptop. Um, so you get this at compile time. Um, there's no dependencies on the file path either. As long as your uh, code file, your module file, is in one of the directories that gets compiled, it can be anywhere. Uh, and the tests run quickly as well, which if you're going through um, like a test every time you make a code change, it's, it's super important that it's fast. Um, otherwise, you'll get frustrated. Um, and there's changes, some changes in Elixir 1.3 as well that, that make this easier. Um, I don't think that was the intent, but as a, as a nice side effect, it does. So there are warnings on imperative assignment. Uh, so this means if you set up a variable um, like, and then change it inside an if, then it's scoped locally, so you'll get a warning saying you shouldn't do that. Um, and, and that was a 1.3 change. Uh, there's mix xref as well, which um, will find functions and modules that don't exist for you. Uh, and this runs automatically when your code's compiled. So uh, for example, if you've got a, a reference to a function that no longer exists because you've, you've moved it, uh, then you'll get a, a warning there. Uh, the compilation times are slightly faster due to the uh, dependency tracking. Uh, and there's also X unit diffing, which is a huge change. Uh, and it looks something like this. So uh, you'll see this is like the output of a, a test. Um, and the, the diff between the, the two strings when using the assert macro, uh, the word lazy here has been removed, and the word brown has been added, which uh, is indicated in green for the word brown. Um, OK, Elixir. So let's talk about Elixir uh, and some refactoring techniques you can use. Um, this is my application. It's called Pokemon Go 2.0. Um, and this is what it looks like before refactoring. And this is what it looks like after refactoring. <laughs> so uh, the, the point about not changing your external behavior, um, that's it right there. So um, oh, speaker notes. So, um, <laughs> so the application looks something like this. Nope this. Um, so I've got these two um, web browsers here. By the way, the projector in here runs at 720p, not 1080, which means that the windows are tiny, but uh, we'll make do. So, uh, so the way the game works is um, you go into the home page and you can view the challenges. And there's currently no challenges, so you can create a challenge. Um, and then it goes into like this waiting state where it's waiting for another player to join. Um, and you can refresh that, and you'll just stay in this waiting state. And then in the other window, you can come along and view the challenges. So hey, I'll join a game with example user. He sounds like a cool guy. Um, so you join the game, 
and both of them have updated, even though it's here. Um, and you'll see that the, uh, the current turn is x. Uh, so x always goes first, but the person who's x and the person who's not. This is tic-tac-toe, by the way. We call it knots and crosses. Um, I'll use the two terms interchangeably. Uh, but the play on the right here is the x's, and the play on the right is the, the knots. So you can't play when it's not your turn, because that would be weird. Um, you can play when it is your turn, but you can't override an existing piece when it's your turn. Play continues, it's like a battle to the death until one person is declared the victor, and they get like a sweet message saying you won, and then the other person lost. Um, so that's it. Uh, I had to disable my, my Wi-Fi as well, so unfortunately I can't let you play um, once I'm doing this, but you know, that's it. So uh, the winning criteria, if you've never played this game before, then that's weird, but um, <laughs> it's one of the classic board games, but just in case, uh, you need three matching pieces in a row. Uh, there's three horizontal win lines, three vertical win lines, two diagonals, uh, and if all the spaces are filled and none of the above criteria are matched, then uh, the game's a draw. So uh, in code, uh, it looks a bit like this. Uh, I apologize if the code's quite small, again, projector. Um, but if you, the, the way the code works here is uh, I've got a cond in there, and it says, uh, so I'm destructuring the list, which is how the board's represented. There's nine elements in the list. I'll get onto why I'm using the list later. Um, and then for each condition, so I've got the three uh, horizontal lines represented first. So I'm saying if A is equal to B and B is equal to C and it's not nil because that's the default, then that means there's a piece there and someone's won, uh, the, the piece A in this case. And then it's, it's kind of okay for the horizontal win line. You can kind of guess, okay, D is equal to E and E is equal to F and those letters come next to each other, so they're probably next to each other. Um, and then you've got the three verticals. You've got A, D, and a, G. And, and then you've got the diagonals, and it gets quite confusing, um, and that's deliberate because um, it's a refactoring talk. Uh, <laughs> So, and then I'm saying, like, if any of the pieces are nil at all, then, um, then the game's still in play and return false, uh, because that obviously means the game's still in play. Uh, and for any other clause, which is the true, uh, it's a draw. So all the pieces have been filled and no one wins. Um, so you, know, you come across this piece of code, your first day at the Pokemon Go 2.0 headquarters, and you're like, who, who wrote this code? Git blame. Um, and it turns out it's this guy. Um, and uh, I use a, a scientific technique here called defactoring which is when you take a piece of code and make it worse. Um, <laughs> the whole commit uh, message here is actually defactor, make game server function awful. Um, and that's, that's what I did. So we can refactor this, right? So we can use a technique um, that's called if to pattern matching. Um, it's fairly descriptive about what it does. Um, so you know, pattern matching is, um, is one of the core concepts in uh, Erlang and Elixir. So let's take a look at how we can do this. So instead of uh, having all these ifs and saying A is equal to B and B is equal to C, we can have uh, pattern matching. So we're pattern matching on the list, and here we see if the first three elements uh, match, and it's not nil, unfortunately we have to put that in, then, um, then the piece is one. Uh, same for the second uh, horizontal line and the third, and then the three verticals, and then two diagonals. And it's a little bit more readable, um, and we've still got like, the, the draw case at the end. It's, uh, it's more idiomatic now because we're using ins, so we're saying if nil is in the board, then uh, the game's still in progress, otherwise it's a draw. Um, I showed this to someone and they were like, ah, it doesn't seem more readable. And I went, okay, fine. Uh, there's a side-by-side -side comparison. Um, so you see there's no, like, you don't have to know what A, B, and C are, or G. Um, but you can also do this, which makes it a lot clearer. Um, so you can, you know, ch like, you can pattern match across multiple lines. You can define your function over multiple lines. Um, and here, like, the, the mat, the uh, layout of the pattern match here is the layout of the grid, and you can clearly see that we're looking at these three pieces. Um, so you'll see that technique as well in like, uh, maybe people making a poker game or something, and you want to check that the suits match, uh, you'll see a similar technique. Uh, so that's if to pattern matching. Um, it's, it's one of the more common uh, refactoring techniques. Uh, use multiple function heads, uh, and in my last example, the layouts match the data structure. Excuse me. So, um, so let's talk about the application. Uh, the way the application is structured is there's challenges that are stored in the database, um, and that's when I clicked on view challenge, create challenge, they get stored in the database. Uh, there's a game server, which is a gen server that holds the state of the game, which is like the players who are in the game, uh, the state of the board, whose turn it is, uh, whether like the game's in progress or not. Uh, and then there's like a registry that maps the IDs of the challenges to the PIDs for the gen servers. Uh, we probably won't look into the code in that, but that's what it does. 
and then all the communications handled over Phoenix channels. So um, here is the, um, the gen server. So there's three functions here. Start link, which is a wrapper around gen server start link. It's pretty common in gen servers. Uh, we have a join function, which joins the game. Um, and then we have a play function, which plays the game. So this is like the public API. And then uh, we have the uh, init function. So here you'll see the, it returns OK. And then the entire state, which at the moment is a map. Uh, the board is a list of nine elements, which um, I used a list because later on I was going to talk about how we could change that to a better data structure, like a tuple. Um, I guess if there's like a tuple with three elements, I like to call it a thripple. So I guess, I'm, <laughs> I guess a nine element tuple would be a nipple. Um, <laughs> so uh, the players is an empty list. Uh, the status is waiting. As I said, the X's always start first, so X turns true. Uh, there's no winner um, and there's no win line. So the function is deliberately. Um, like obfuscated. Um, so the first clause is saying when there's less than two users in the room, then uh, check that the user's already there. And if they are, that's fine. Just return to state. And that's why refresh works. Um, if there's um, like a new player, then prepend them to the list. If they're the only player there, then they go into a waiting state. Um, if both players go in, we shuffle the list of two elements. And that's how we randomize who, who places which marker. Uh, and the game goes into a started state. And then we update the state and return that state. Um, and then we got the second clause here for the join as well, which says if the user's in the game, that's fine and they can play. Otherwise, the, game, the game's full and they've got no business being there. Like, if you've ever tried to play this game with three people, you've got like the knots, the crosses, and the triangles. Um, it doesn't work. So the other thing we've got is play. So uh, again, we check if, it is, if it's a valid move, and that means it's within the bounds of the grid. Uh, like, you can't place a piece at a negative index, uh, and you can't play a piece that's further on. Um, and you also can't override an existing piece. I'll show that function in a minute. Uh, and then we say, uh, if it's the user's turn, so the way we do that is um, if they're the first player and it's the X's turn, then we return OK0. Um, I'm using 0 and 1 here to represent the, the knots and the crosses because it's a talk about refactoring. Uh, what you should actually do in this case is maybe use an atom for like a knot and a cross. That would be way easier to read. Um, so it's just a little thing I put in there. Uh, otherwise, it's not your turn and you can't play. Uh, then we take the result of that and we pipe it through a case and um, then we like work out who, which piece it is. We update the board using list.replace that because we're using a list. Um, and then we update the state. We check if the game's won using the game one function I showed earlier. Uh, and then we update the state. Uh, if there is no winner yet, then we just invert the X turn and it's the other person's turn. Uh, if it's a draw, then the game's finished and there's no winner. And if it's anything else, uh, X is a terrible variable to use here because that's got like context in this application, uh, but that's like whoever won. So that should be the winner. And they get assigned as the winner, and then the line gets set so it can be highlighted in the, the front end. Um, and then anything else will return an error. Um, and here's the valid move function. So if the index is less than zero, then uh, it's an invalid move. And if, so we're using enum to at here, which means that it has to be within the bounds of the list. And instead of returning nil, which is the default value, because that's the default value of the board, we're returning invalid, uh, which means that nil is true and anything else is false, um, which is, again, deliberately confusing. Uh, and here's the game one function that we got earlier. So why refactor this? Right, It totally works, um, but it's, it's difficult to read. Like I wrote the code, and I was struggling there. Uh, <laughs> there there's some unnecessary duplication. Uh, I don't want you to think like all duplication is bad. That's not true. Um, there's a case of left pad and NPM where some duplication would have been good. Um, <laughs> so you know, a little duplication is better than a little dependency. Um, uh, but it takes some time to understand and get in the zone of what this code is doing. So next thing we can do is uh, a technique called case to function. And what we do here is we're looking out for nested cases. Uh, and this is something that a lot of beginners to the language do. They'll put like just cases because it's easy. Um, and, and that's fine, but th there are different ways you can approach this. Uh, so it helps prevent nested cases and removes like horizontal code um, in favor of vertical code. It's like named functions. Uh, and the functions have names, so it's more descriptive of the intent. So this piece of code here for the join has a nested case. Um, if you can't see it, it's uh, this case here, which is inside an if. So what we can do is just move this to a function called check all players present. And now we don't have an nested case. We have a function call instead. Uh, and the function looks exactly the same as the case did before. Uh, it, it returns um, the, the, a tuple with uh, the players that are in the game and the state of the game now. 
So that, that was it, that was all there was to it. Um, so the next thing we can do is move the callback code to functions. So this is a similar technique. Uh, when I'm writing a gen server, I like to keep my uh, callbacks pretty small and pass off to some helper function. Uh, and the same goes for like a Phoenix controller. You don't want like lots of logic in your controller actions. You want to move it out to a helper function. Um, so it's more descriptive uh, because they're named. Again, it's very similar to last factor, but the test should still pass because, uh, so the test for this gen server, I forgot to mention, are a little bit complicated because the public API is so small and you don't know who's playing first. So you need to work out whose turn it is by trying to join and then it'll tell you whose turn it is. Uh, and then you need to, based on whose turn it is, send different play commands and work out all the states for all the win lines and all the draw conditions, uh, which is a little confusing. But it, it works, so the tests are there, so I'd probably keep them. Uh, so let's look at the uh, join function again. So we've got this clause here. Uh, and instead of having the entire body like we've got here, uh, we can call a join user function. So this is still the clause when there's less than two users. Um, and the join user is like the helper function. So it updates the state. So we're passing the whole state object, and I'll get onto why we're doing that shortly. Uh, but it's quite a common technique for state transformations to pass the entire state through. Uh, so here's the join user function. So again, if the user's there, that's fine, return the state. Otherwise, update the game players. Uh, so I've renamed this function, which used to be called check all players present to um, update game players. And that's because it, now it returns an entirely new state. Um, and if we look back up here, you'll see that the state is, is replied. To, uh, sorry, here. You'll see that, that gets, it's what gets responded to the WebSocket. Um, there's still these two clauses, though. And we can consolidate these down into one clause uh, that looks something like this. So because um, if you're there, then it returns OK in the state. And because if you get added, it returns OK in the state, uh, we can match on the join user function and check for the, the state. And if it's OK state, then we'll update the state and return the new state. Uh, otherwise, we'll keep the existing state and reply with whatever was returned, which is probably going to be an error. Uh, and the join user function now is, uh, makes heavy use of pattern matching. So the first clause says, if there's one user in the game and it's me, then that's cool and return the state. Uh, the second clause says if there's two players in the game and I'm either player one or player two, then that's fine, return to state. Uh, you'll probably notice here that instead of like saying when user ID in players, I've got to say when user ID in P1, P2. This is because guards need to be available at compile time, so um, I need to build it manually, uh, and that's why I use that. Uh, in the next one, we call our update game players function as we did before, and for anything else, the game's full. Um, you can not play. So uh, if we look at the, the diff so far for the join function, we've got the, it, this is what it looked like before, uh, where it was just everything within the handle calls. And this is what it looks like now. So it's not actually shorter, but refactoring is not about writing shorter code. It's about writing more declarative code and more understandable code. So uh, up next is the play function. So this will use similar techniques to the join function. Um, so I'm not going to go through each function in detail. Um, but we're refactoring into functions, and then we'll go on to something different. So here's what it looked like before, if you remember. I'm not going to go through it again, because it took forever. Um, but the, uh, it now looks like this. So we've got one function. It looks exactly the same as a join. We've got some case, and then we do something, whether it, if it's OK. Otherwise, we return the error. Uh, and then we've got this update game state function, which updates the game state. Uh, we've got the valid move function, which we had before. Uh, then we've got the player's turn, which checks whether you know, you're know you're player one and it's the X turns and so on. Uh, the play turn function uh, takes a state and it places the marker and then updates the game win state based on if someone's won or not or if, if it's a draw. Uh, the place marker updates the, the board and the game win state just checks if there's a winner and returns them. Um, so let's talk about case to pipeline. So this was pretty common pre-Elixir 1.2. Um, and what you would do is you wanted your function to read as a series of transformations. Um, if you can't spot it, look out for the pipeline operator. Uh, so we've got this function here, which looks a bit ugly because we're, um, for some reason, piping into a case when we could just call case and then the function, but let's ignore that for now. Um, and instead of writing it like this, we can write this. So we can say state, and then check if the, the move's valid, check if it's the player's turn, and then play the turn. Uh, the problem with this is that we need to know um, what's happening with the response, so we can no longer just return what we want. We have to wrap it in some way. So we start by returning OK from the valid move instead of making it a Boolean. And then in each function here, we have to match and say, if it's an error, return the error. Um, and if it's OK something, then that's fine, and we'll use the state. 
Uh, same here, if it's an error, return the error. So we have to constantly tag our values whether it's an error or not an error. Um, and what we can do instead of this, so this was pre-1.2 pre and it was a big problem and there was lots of posts on the mailing list about it and everyone was writing their own monad libraries. There's about 14 monad libraries on hex. Um, don't use any of them. Oh, you can actually, I'm not here to tell you what to do. So uh, the case to pipeline though, uh, so there's a built-in solution. Um, so the problem with case to pipeline is it makes the first function look nice but you have to modify all your functions and their return values. Instead, we can use uh, something that was introduced in Elixir 1.2. It's probably my favorite thing that's been introduced to language. It's called with, I use it all the time. Uh, it removes the need to change your function heads, but it still reads a series of transformations, uh, which you'll see in a minute. Uh, it enforces matching at each step, um, which will make more sense in a second. Um, but you can also assign inside the, the width. So here's our pipeline. And here it is using width. So you see, when I say um, it has to match, it means that if the valid move doesn't return OK, then the width will stop and it'll return whatever the result of valid move was. Same with OK marker. If player's turn doesn't return OK marker, then it'll return whatever the, the result was. Uh, and then here we're using an assignment here, so we're saying the new state is this, and then do, so return the new state. Um, and then in the case, if we get OK state, then that's fine, and we'll return that. If we get anything else, we'll return whatever was returned. So when I say it still reads as a pipeline, as a series of transformations, it does, you just have to shift your eyes about 20 characters to the right, um, and then that works. But there's still a problem here, uh, which was fixed in Elixir 1.3, uh, which is this part here. So piping into case is, um, is it's a little bit ugly, but it was quite a common pattern when using with. Uh, but what we can do instead is um, Elixir 1.3 introduce with else. So we can now say with, with something do, and that's the positive path, else, and then we match um, it, it matches the same like a case would match. So we say for anything else, return the, that result. Um, and that's the whole function there. Um, so that's kind of all the, the functions looking nice now. Um, but they're still using a map for the state. And what we can do instead is use a struct, uh, which is a construct that's built on top of maps. So it's a map with an underscore, underscore, struct, underscore, underscore um, key in it that points to a module. Um, you can match on structs as well. So you can say only this struct is valid. Uh, for this function. Um, it ensures the correct types as well, and that's especially true if you're using something like Dialyzer, then you can specify types to your modules. Uh, so you get the compile time guarantees, and you can implement protocols on top of them, which I don't go into in this talk, but the gist is that maybe we'd want to implement the inspect protocol for our game, and then when you output it to the terminal, it shows as like an ASCII version of the grid. Should have done that thing. So um, here's what a struct looks like. You call def struct inside your module, uh, and the contents here are just copied from the map. So it looks exactly the same, except it's now structured. Um, and we now can return the default game state in our init function instead of having the whole map in there. Uh, and then each function matches for that particular struct, which is a game struct. Uh, if you try and call this function with anything else, then you'll get a, a match error. Uh, and I've just updated that all the way through the file. So now we have this module that we can use um, for like our struct. So we can move all the functions that we've defined now over to that module. Um, and that means like our code and data are together, which is, is really useful because you, know, you can see what, what you can change. Um, it's easier to test as well because you've got all these functions now. So before we had to set up the gen serve in a particular state, which you can also do with sys.get state and um, update state or write state, but you, um, I had to like play the game for the test to work, whereas now I can test my edge cases um, in this particular module. And you can module doc false it or doc false particular functions you don't want people to depend on, um, and you can still test them, and that's quite a good technique. So here, um, I've just moved all the functions over. Um, so this is now the game module, and all the functions exist in there. Um, and then here, instead of just calling the local join user function, I'm calling game.joinuser or game.update game state. Okay, so that's Elixir. Um, the techniques are fairly applicable to any library you're using, so uh, that's why it took so long. Uh, but we'll talk about Ecto now. Um, so a common thing in Ecto is counting. So this is what it would look like prior to Ecto 2. A lot of people write code like this. And what we're doing here is counting the challenges for a particular user. So we get the user, we get their associated challenges, and then we use a fragment to get the count. Uh, and then use repo one to ensure one result returned. Um, and I used to see a lot of people, so I picked my uh, things that I would discuss based on like what comes up all the time on mailing lists or Stack Overflow. 
Um, and what you can do in Ecto2 is use repo.aggregate, which is really nice. It takes a queryable and it takes some form of aggregation, which is like a count or an average or a sum, uh, and it takes a field. Um, so you can repo to aggregate. Um, so one of the things that we do in this game is we fetch the uh, open challenges for a user, and then we increment a field on the users called refuse challenge count under the assumption that like, they're so good that no one wants to take them on anymore. Because if you've ever played this game, you'll know that after like four games, all games end in a draw. Um, and then we'll remove the challenges from the database because we don't need them anymore. Uh, we need to stop all the processes for the games that are run, like, because we start the process when you um, join the game as the first player. So we can stop those now and remove the PIDs from the registry. Um, so we can use some, a new feature in Ecto2 called Ecto Multi for this. So it's kind of like a pipeline, but for your database transactions. Um, but you can also run arbitrary functions in here, which I've got an example of. So um, currently we use a transaction. So we have this repo transaction on line seven. Uh, we're using with now because I've shown it so I can use it. Uh, so we say update the user, and then if the user updates successfully, then delete all the challenges, and if the challenges are deleted successfully, then stop the games. And the reason we do it in this order is because if we like delete the challenges but the games don't stop, then we no longer have a reference of which challenges uh, existed, so we can't, we'll never be able to stop the games for that. Um, and anything else, we use repo.rollback, which rolls back the entire transaction. So uh, here's the function. So this one um, negates the age to get all the old challenges because it's not like a date time uh, subtract function Ecto, it's only date time add. But if you add a negative value, that's the same subtraction. Uh, so we get all the challenges that are older in a certain time period and fetch them. Uh, the delete challenges composes a query for all the challenge IDs that we have and calls delete all on them. Um, the stop game maps over the game registry calling delete game on each, each element. Uh, and then the update is uh, using a change set and updates the refuse challenges with the count that we pass through. So what we can do instead is use an Ecto multi. So Ecto multi, you start with Ecto multi new, and that starts a multi struct. Uh, and then each time uh, you add a function, you give it a name, and when Ecto multi returns, it returns a map of the name and the particular value that was returned uh, when you execute that function. So um, instead of like updating the user directly, we pass a change set, and then that will be called to the Ecto multi update. Uh, same with deletes. So instead of deleting the users directly, we call delete challenge query, which returns a query, which then gets passed to delete all. Here's a function. So the argument that gets passed that we're ignoring is the um, state of the multi this far when it's executing. And um, we're calling stop games, but we're ignoring the, the argument. Uh, and then you can pass that to you pipe it through to reboot a transaction. Um, so these functions now return queries instead of actually executing. Uh, and the other thing is the for a multi to succeed, it needs to return OK something. So that's why we're returning OK something uh, and not just OK. So Ecto Multi returns a data structure that you can pass into transaction, but that's not the only thing you can do with it. It's uh, quite easy to test as well because you can pipe into two lists and then perform assertions on it. Um, so, so that's useful um, you know, for like testing it in isolation. Uh, they get executed in order from top to bottom. So if anything fails, then uh, it'll stop executing the entire multi pipeline. Um, and it won't run if you've got change set errors as well, so it doesn't even need to go to the database to fail. It can fail if you've got change set validation error. Uh, so that was Ecto Multi. Let's talk about Phoenix. Um, so, <laughs> what was that? So, um, <laughs> so uh, the Phoenix generators are, as we always say, a learning tool. Uh, so they're fast to get up and running. Um, and by default, this is what will happen. So if your get from the repo returns uh, like can't be found, then it'll show a 404, which by default looks like the bottom right picture there. Uh, and if you get a 500 error, so say you're using UUIDs and you pass a non-UUID, then you'll get a, an internal server error. So what we'll want to do instead, you can customize these pages, by the way, but that's what they look like by default. Um, so what we want to do instead is if you can't find or there's a 500, then we want to show a flash message and redirect the user to like the list of challenges. Um, Probably show you what that looks like. It looks like this. Yeah, looks like that. So that's um, that's an error. But in um, when it doesn't raise an error, it'll be fine. Oh, actually, I'm using a different branch. That'll be why. So um, what we want to do is override the action. Uh, so this is something you can do in uh, Phoenix controllers. Uh, the action is called at the end of the pipeline, um, and by default, it calls apply with the action name for the controller, uh, and it passes in the con and con.params. So um, 
here is the generated controller. I've omitted the index creating new actions because they're not relevant for this particular example. But you'll see that this line here appears over and over again in each function, and that's the thing that will raise, that will trigger the 400 or the 500, uh, 404 or the 500 error. Uh, what we can do instead is we can override action. It's def overridable in Phoenix controller. So um, here I'm assigning the, the action name to act name because both action and action name are taken by Phoenix controller, so you have to come up with something new. Um, I'm using with again, and I'm saying if the action is either show edit, update, or delete, then find the resource, and if it successfully finds the resource, then we call apply on the module with the action name, uh, but we pass this additional third argument, which is the challenge. Um, else, so this is matching uh, on the else of a with. Uh, if it's false, then we apply with just the two arguments, so this will be true for index, uh, create a new. And if we get error not found, then we'll put a flash message saying not found, redirect back to the child path, and then halt. Um, so the find resource function uh, looks like this. So we're saying if the UUID is castable, then it's a valid UUID, and, and we'll continue. Uh, and then if we can find the challenge, then we'll return OK challenge. And otherwise, we'll return error not found. And that's the thing that matches that triggers the flash message. Uh, and then in all the actions here, so instead of calling like the repo.get inside the um, controller, we can have this third argument here, uh, challenge. And that's passed through to each of them. So yeah, so overriding action uh, allows for explicit parameters in your actions. Uh, they can come from anywhere as well. So uh, you can also define a custom controller. So maybe you've got like a user that you want to use in several controllers. You can define your own controller and then use that instead of using my app.web controller. Uh, and that will work as well. Um, so the other thing we can do instead is like find with a plug. So plugs are, are pretty common in Phoenix. Like the whole thing is a series of plugs. Um, a plug is called before the action. Uh, we can combine it with the previous technique as well. So you can use a combination of the plug and defining an override. Uh, you can use function plugs or module plugs. If you use a module plug, then you can use it in multiple places. But if you use a function plug, then it's, it's got to be local to the controller. Um, and I've scrolled there. So we call it with, uh, with plug. Um, so we say plug find resource when the action is one of these actions. Uh, and then our find resource function now looks slightly different. We're still doing the with, but if it succeeds, then we'll assign the challenge on the, on the con dot assigns. Um, otherwise, we'll put the flash message there, uh, and then we'll return, or we'll redirect the challenge path, and they'll see the flash message. Uh, and then what we can do instead is use con dot assigns dot challenge. So uh, here, I actually didn't need to keep this in, but I have for, for demonstration purposes. So uh, because it's already on assigns, we could just go ahead and call render directly. Um, but I'm passing it through explicitly here to show you the difference between the previous version. And you'll see that it's in all of these. Um, we use con.assigns.challenge instead. And if you were to combine the two techniques, you could just check con.params in your action override and then pass it through as a function argument. So there are a couple other things in Phoenix that um, I should probably mention. The first is that plugs can be used in most places. Um, you can use them in the endpoint. So I've used this before to check if you're on a subdomain or not, uh, because it needs to happen before your router, because you can only have one, um, one route to a particular resource in your router. Uh, in, in the router as well, a common place, uh, a common like, reason you do this is if you want to guard a particular set of routes on, behind authentication or authorization, then you could use a plug in there. Uh, and then you can use them in controllers, um, as, as I saw. So uh, the other thing that I should mention is you want to try and keep your modules web focused. So this is kind of what Chris was talking about yesterday, where you want to pass off to some other module um, in some sort of context or domain that does all your logic that's not web stuff. Um, the, the general technique I use for this is to keep repo at your controllers. So you can just open up your web.ex file, delete the alias for repo, and then watch everything break, and then slowly fix it. Um, and this also has the benefit that it allows other interfaces into your domain. So the web isn't the only way into your, your application. You could also maybe have a mixed task or um, you know, some other way in to your domain logic. Uh, so in summary, you want to keep your team and future you happy, uh, write main, more maintainable code, uh, and reduce the technical debt. And uh, yeah, that's it. Thank you. This is me. Uh, I'm Gazler, except for Twitter, where I was late, and I'm the Gazler. Uh, I work at a company called Voice Layer doing push to talk stuff. And uh, the repo is open source, and each um, change is like a commit, so you can go through and step through these examples. Thank you.
Um, any questions, by the way? One at the front. Uh, I had a question about, uh, so the multi with the, the non-database interaction point. So I, uh, with the multi, if, if any of the individual uh, commands that are happening there, there are database related, that would be like within a transaction, presumably? Is that mm -hmm. accurate? The whole thing is a transaction. So you're piping the whole chain of uh, things you built up into a transaction. So, so if you wanted to have that uh, non-database related thing uh, not apply, you'd maybe just always put it as the last piece of the multi? Uh, you can put it anywhere you want. As long as it returns error something, then the multi will stop. If it returns OK something, then it will continue through the, the multi. But I want my non-database related thing that I put into a multi to also roll back. But right? uh, Well, that depends on what that thing is, right? If, exactly. you're, like sto if you're stopping um, things in a gen server, then after you've killed the PID, you can't like you know, resuscitate the PID, like it's yeah. gone, it's dead. <laughs> um, so in that case, like you just have to think about how your application works in that particular case. Putting it at the end is one, one way. Um, having some sort of fallback in place for if you can't kill it is another. Um, you know, maybe you could persist the state first, then if none of them, uh, if they don't all die, then roll back and, you know, keep the state as it was, perhaps. Um, but yeah, you're right, you need to totally think about that. Okay. Thank you. Question at the front here. Let's wait until we. Oh, sorry. Uh, there are examples there where you were talking about going from horizontal to vertical, yeah. being better. And I've, you know, I've had that same idea, but when I put stuff in a function heads, the guards end up out in like column sixty or seventy. So there's kind of some, <laughs> uh, there's some tension there. So I haven't really figured out how to do that. Right. So you got horizontal but not nested. Um, so you can write your guards across multiple lines, uh, as I did in the first example with the grid. Uh, and that's fine. So maybe you could like have your arg like the arguments to your function on separate lines and guard against each one individually. Uh, but you're right, that totally happens all the time, and you need to find a way to fix it. Um, anytime I'm unsure about code style thing, I just go to the like Elixir repository and look at how they do it, um, and spend hours searching for an example, and then just copy that. Uh, does that answer your question? Yeah. Good. Anyone else? No, I think, I think that's it. Okay, thank you very much.